So I want to talk a little bit about my, my new life as a, as a computer scientist and software developer. Um, even though my degrees are in mathematics, this has um, become my uh, passion and full-time job over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about Irish and my work on the, the Celtic languages, but a lot of what I do is, is pitch very broadly. Um, I work with lots of language groups, both in um, Native American groups in the U.S., some African languages, languages in the Philippines, uh, a few others as well. Um, so I'd like to just, for those of you who aren't maybe linguists or familiar with language endangerment and the, the, the sort of big picture of language endangerment, I just wanted to run through some of the numbers. Um, so there are the generally accepted numbers, there are about 7,000 languages spoken in the world. Um, and there's a UNESCO Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger. Um, that's a, it's a website with maps and uh, an accounting of all of the endangered languages of the world with some sort of measure of how endangered they are. And the upshot there is that something like half of the world's languages are, are, have some level of endangerment, which means that they're endangered not being spoken, say, in a generation or two. Um, so one of the things I work on, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, is looking at the presence of languages online and on, on the web. And this, I don't get into it, but this comes from trying to produce, trying to do machine learning for endangered languages, and you need training data to do that, and the best place to get it is from the web. So, um, so this comes out of research of mine that I, I may say a word about, um, looking at um, crawling the web very broadly, and doing language identification on written text on the web and trying to see um, what's out there, basically. Um, so the best estimate I have is that something like 2,500 or 3,000 languages have some online presence. So let's say at least one web page or text written in that language that appears online. Um, now, the shocking thing, and I don't even think many linguists know this number, this fact, um, this also comes out of, comes out of my work, is that um, even though there are, you can find a web page, say, in something like 3,000 languages, the vast majority of that material online is produced for evangelical reasons, so it's either Bible translations or some other kind of Christian evangelical material. Um, and if you look at, say, blogs or social media posts or material that's actually primary material produced by the language community, my best guess is that it's less than a thousand of the seven thousand languages of the world have a writing system that is in use by members of the language community and not evangelicals, and are also online and producing that material online. So that's a shocking number to me. So something like less than a seventh of the world's languages. And of course, more than half of the world's languages don't even have a writing system at all. It's Bible translation that's sort of driven the development of a lot of orthographies. Um, when you get down into looking at sort of larger scale production of language online by language communities, Wikipedia is a good place to look. And there, you can see there are something like 300 languages on Wikipedia right now. Um, I've worked on a lot with social media and Twitter. Similar number of languages have some presence on Twitter, so at least one tweet for, it's probably closer to 300 languages now, so on the same order of magnitude. Um, when you start to look at language technologies, so things that people can use to ease their, their online lives and language, um, there are spell checkers for about 180 languages. Um, the Google search interface, if you go to google.com um, and you can select your language there, that's available and translated into about 150 languages. And again, it's not much to translate there. It's like, I'm feeling lucky and whatever search, and, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's some kind of online presence. I'll, I'll say a little bit more in a bit about um, software translation. Uh, and then of course more advanced um, language technologies like machine translation from one language to another. If you go to Google Translate right now, there are about um, 100 languages supported, which is um, again a tiny fraction of, of what's out there. But again, when you look at this number, that's some pretty good progress. I'll also say more about um, quality and so on. So what do I mean by language technology? Um, there's machine translation, uh, speech recognition software. So I want to speak into Siri and ask her questions um, and get answers back and ask to understand the language that you're speaking. Um, predictive text is a simple example of language technology that's pretty easy to produce. Um, so if you're texting and it's 
do it autocomplete and autocorrect and things like that. Uh, search engines like Google are fundamentally um, language, pieces of language technology because they deal with human language in the written form. Um, so to be able to search, English search is relatively relatively easy, but when you're talking about languages that have complicated morphology and so on, search becomes a, a slightly more complicated game, but there's language technology underlying all that. Uh, dialogue systems brings us into um, kind of the realm of AI and being able to have a conversation with some sort of conversational agent that not only understands what you're saying, but can interpret it and maybe give answers back to you intelligently. Um, I mentioned spell checkers and grammar checkers. These are sort of more on the, um, the, the basic side of things in terms of language technologies, but the number I showed you just earlier shows that there's sort of big gaps in, in terms of coverage. And then a couple kind of edge cases that I'm interested in that I'll, that I'll try and squeeze in at the end. Uh, one is the idea of text normalization. So uh, whatever the number of actual orthographies there are in the world that are used by the language community. Very few of them are formalized and official. Um, and uh, what that means is there's a wide variety of writing systems that are in use. Some of them kind of idealect systems that are used by individuals where they're writing according to the way they hear the sounds. And that those all present challenges for, um, um, for trying to do machine learning and produce these technologies using the raw data that's out on, on the web because there's such a variety of um, writing styles. I've done a lot with Haitian Creole is a really good example of that. There actually are standards for Haitian Creole writing, um, but not too many people follow them very carefully. So when you're trying to produce training data and train systems, you have to somehow deal with that question. And Irish is the other example where this is a, a big deal. I'll come back and talk about that. Uh, and then another fun and interesting one is the idea of um, just not OCR scanning old books and texts. This is another way I'm going to talk about producing training data for some of these systems. If you have lots of old printed books like we do for Irish, that's a, a source of lots of really rich training data, but it means you have to go back and scan all those books. I'll show an example of that. So I want to talk about Google Translate for a little bit. Um, I'm uh, so this is so I, I speak the Irish language, which is how I got into this work. Um, originally, there is a brand new word in Irish, which is prashtakon, uh, which you can see here is um, a combination of the word prashik, which is something like a mess, you make a, a mess of something, uh, prashik yenev, uh, and then the word for um, a translation, astrakhan. So these have been mashed up. And this word has emerged since the emergence of Google Translate, or since its release for Irish in 2011 or 2012. Um, so this, so I'm on Twitter, and I sort of collect people post examples of road signs and government documents, which have been clearly translated by Google Translate. <laughs> uh, I collect these and uh, use them in talks. Or uh, so this one is incredible. Any, uh, I know we have at least one Irish speaker here. Anybody else know a little bit of Irish? Do you, can I put you on the spot? Do you have any idea what's going on with this one? It sounds like there's an egg going through a road. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is uh, not even really an Irish word. That, what, that is, in, what Google intends there, it's the first four letters of the word for number. So the word for number is ifer. They abbreviated. And what they did was they trained Google Translate using government documents, presumably, where there were, it's actually from, I think from the, um, the uh, enacted laws in Ireland are online bilingually, presumably Google tr uh, crawled all of those. Mm -hmm. And the convention there is that they have the different acts numbered NO.1, <laughs> NO.2, and the same in the Irish on the Irish side. And then when you do machine learning and you sort of do the automatic pairing up of words and phrases, those get paired up. And the rest is history. So um, that's a particularly egregious example. Um, there's also a small grammatical example that I may a grammatical error in this. That there, this B should be something different. Um, I may come back and talk about that in a little bit. Um, I also learned that there is a, a similar um, word in Welsh um, where they have a similar portmanteau word, which is, I think it's scumraig, which is a combination of scum and the word for Welsh in Welsh. Um, which emerged around the same time when Google Translate was um, was released in Welsh. So 
Uh, I'm being a little unfair, so I'm sort of a, a fan of uh, Google and a lot of the work that's going on there, and I work on machine translation myself. Uh, it is easy to pick on machine translation systems. You could do this to the systems that I've released as well. They make mistakes, and they make really bad mistakes sometimes. <laughs> the only way, to be fair, the only way you can um, uh, evaluate a system is by sort of looking at its performance on a large scale and coming up with evaluation numbers and so on. So. So this is a fun game, but um, you do have to be a little bit fair. Um, the reason I wanted to mention it is because of the kind of social impact that the release of the, the system has had, in at least in the Irish context. I don't know much about um, the other languages where it's supported, uh, but it's had, on the whole, a really <coughs> negative impact on the Irish language community, believe it or not. So if you think that there was excitement when it first came out, um, but as as things have panned out, there's a constitutional obligation in Ireland to, it's a, Irish language is the first official language in the Republic of Ireland, and that puts a burden on all government agencies and public bodies to translate everything into Irish. Um, because it's such a small minority, there's um, some <coughs> cynicism and uh, resentment about this, because it, it uh, uh, imposes costs on these, on these bodies. Um, so since the release of Google Translate, there's been more and more material that should have been translated by a human translator and it's just been passed through Google Translate. Another egregious example um, was that two years ago was the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Easter Rising in Ireland. Uh, they had a big fancy website that was released as part of that and then the first release it was bilingual and the Irish was um, had been just pasted in from Google Translate. Um, so, so this is an example to me of, um, I talk about this when I, when I teach this stuff to our, uh, um, this Taming Big Data class, we talk about some of the, the negative impacts of AI and machine learning and uh, the, the negative impacts they can have on actual real communities. And in this case, there are government services that should be provided to the Irish speaking community and they're just not being provided. Uh, talk about um, speech technology, I don't really work on speech um, all that actively. Um, this is another unfair example. Uh, Siri, there's no speech recognition technology for Irish, so it's, it's work in progress. There's a group, really active group at Trinity College uh, Dublin uh, working on this stuff right now. Um, for fun, I spoke in Irish, asked a question in Irish to uh, Siri last night and took a screenshot. Uh, I'll put you on the spot again. You have any no idea? <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul Paul Berenach. Paul Berenach. I was so I was, I was saying, where's the nearest Irish pub? How will and Paul Berenach is Hungary, and uh, so that's what came out. But again, that's unfair because uh, they, they were assuming that I was speaking English to it. And, and, uh, um, anyway, so this is a big gap. Um, I'm mentioning it in part. I'll talk a little bit about one of the, the strategies for collecting training data for speech. Um, but this is a big gap, and I think for a lot of the um, endangered languages, especially where they're mostly oral communities, um, speech technology is going to be the way that those communities interact with devices and come online. That's probably going to be true for major languages as well over the next 10 years or so. Um, so work in progress. A couple just fun um, examples for Irish, uh, just bits of total madness. Um, going back into the 80s and 90s, uh, the largest repository of Irish language text in existence um, are the archives of some old email lists. So these were the sort of the social networks of the day, going back into the 80s and 90s. Uh, there were sometimes thousands of members of these lists, and it was the first time that Irish speakers from around the world interacted with each other. These are the days of before Unicode, and um, well, there was there were 8-bit encoding, so you could type accents in Irish on your computer. But when you sent them across the internet or emailed them to people, they tended to break. So people very naturally fell into a convention. We only have acute accents on vowels and Irish. Those are the only diacritics. The convention that developed was to just put a, a forward slash after the vowel with the accent. And hmm. It made things readable and workable, and it was all ASCII, and you could communicate without these errors. Now the problem is that 30 years later, this huge gold mine of Irish language text is completely invisible to Google search, for example, because Google just assumes that words, they work on the basis of words, 
and they chop this up, and that looks like a word to them between two slashes, but that's not a word at all, right? This whole thing is the word, etc. So uh, it's an example of um, how things can just go completely off the rails, um, and sort of a consequence of this legacy um, convention that we had. Um, and then one other fun example, I'm interested in, in um, a lot of the really rich Irish language that is, uh, in a sense, locked up in old books. So there were a huge number of books published after Ireland, Ireland became independent in the 1920s, um, when they were trying to actively revive the language and make it the kind of everyday language of, of the entire country. There was a program to translate a lot of literature from European languages and from English as kind of material for the reading public. Um, and then also original writing as well in Irish. So there were hundreds and hundreds of books, um, probably more than a thousand books published by the government agency, publishing agency in the 20s and 30s. Uh, they all used the old Irish fonts, um, virtually all of them. Um, and if you try and run simple OCR on, on these books, these fonts, you get gibberish out. So I don't know how visible it is, but the, the stuff on the right is, is nonsense. Now, it is possible to train uh, systems to recognize um, OCR. I wanted to, uh, to recognize these old fonts. I, I bring this up in part, even though it's a partially solved problem. The issue here is that this is what I copied straight out of um, Google Books. So this is uh, what Google Books does is they run OCR using some, say, default settings for whatever the books that they have are. So this is the PDF. They don't have it tuned to do, say, language recognition or font recognition and apply the appropriate OCR. Um, and what that means is that, again, all of this material is invisible to the search engines. So there's uh, a sort of disconnect between the things that we're able to do now, so lots of us working on Irish, and we can do, we can solve some of these problems, and then being able to actually deploy it in a way that um, everybody in the world would be able to use. So we have some contact with Google, but in a sense not enough, and that's kind of one of the points that I wanted to um, bring up. Uh, so what is it that we need if we want to do all these things? And I'll sort of back up and just talk about uh, languages very broadly again. So a lot of the technologies that I've described use machine learning. Um, and to do machine learning, you need training data. So we need lots of linguistic data, be it written data or spoken data. Um, so that's first and foremost um, the, the focus of what we're doing is for the languages that have some significant <coughs> online presence, can we assemble enough material and employ some, even the standard machine learning techniques to produce good machine translation or speech recognition and so on. Um, so that's the main focus. Uh, the other thing I, I want to talk about a little bit um, are, is it, is it possible to tailor the standard, when I say standard machine learning approaches, the ones that are sort of um, uh, the state-of-the-art systems that are evaluated and tested on English and the other major languages, um, can we take those and can we improve them beyond simply plugging in our data sets into those standard approaches? And I think the answer is yes, and I think for a lot of languages that's absolutely critical. Um, so I'll give one simple example of how you can, how you can do that. Uh, two other things, so I have these bolded because I'm going to talk about these, but I just wanted to bring up two other things that, I'm, that I'll just pass over quickly. Um, maybe more, it's probably more of a real issue than the top two, uh, but it's the just lack of technical skill in a lot of the communities. So even in Ireland, which has um, got a lot of technology um, companies and skills and so on and so forth, there are only really three of us that are, maybe four of us, that are um, academics working full-time on Irish language technology. Um, there are a couple PhD students, but this is just barely enough to sustain active research in the long term. So that's something we're pushing to, to um, get more funding for the Irish government, for example, to fund PhD students and, and so on to, to sustain that. But that's Irish, which is in a very good situation relative to a lot of the other languages, um, you know, in, in Haiti or the Philippines or a lot of these other places where there are people interested in doing this stuff, there are <coughs> people with PhDs in natural language processing or computer science that are focused on, on these problems. And that's, that's really the huge gap. And what that means in practice is that um, 
so Google Translate exists in Haitian Creole, but it was developed by non-speakers, for example. So they was purely taking the standard language independent algorithms and plugging training data into them. Um, it's sort of an oversimplification, but that's, uh, that's going to be the issue going forward. Uh, and then the, the, the point that I just mentioned is um, we have to have better collaboration. So a lot of the best research is coming out of Google and uh, Facebook, especially these days. There's also machine learning research at Twitter. Um, but there has to be better collaboration with the language experts that are on the ground. If, if this is indeed possible, we have to help them with that. We have better data than Google does, for, sh for sure, for Irish, and it's probably true for a lot of other languages as well, because they're not sort of scanning books and doing all the craziness we're doing for our dictionary projects. Um, but there has to be connections and the willingness on their part to say, you know, we can benefit and we can improve the tools that we're delivering. From our side, what it means is even if we're doing better research and if we produce a better Google Translate, uh, it doesn't matter because nobody's going to use it if it's not Google Translate, right? It's that question of deploying and putting it in front of the right people. Okay. So, um, so how do you collect, if I wanted to build training data for Irish, if I wanted to collect every bit of Irish that's ever been written on the internet, how would I, how would I do that? Well, that's what I've tried to do over the last 20 years. So I started doing this almost 20 years ago, but, and I wrote a web crawler to do it. So, um, so a web crawler, he feed it some URLs of documents that are written in Irish, and um, it downloads those and saves them in some appropriate format, and then finds all the links in those documents and follows those links, finds new Irish language documents, and if those are in Irish, it follows those links, and it sort of spiders out around the internet. So this is what Google does to, to create their search indices. indices. Um, but I was focused on a particular languages one at a time. I didn't have the capacity to crawl the entire uh, web, but it was tractable to, um, with a single computer, crawl all of the pages that were written in Irish on the web. It's gotten harder as more languages come online. That has scaled up to become a massive project. Uh, I started really just with Irish in 2000 or so. I worked on the other Celtic languages 2003, 2004, so I was running six languages, I think, in 2004, and I'm now running 2,250 crawlers for uh, different languages around the world. So, so this is where that number 2,500-ish comes from, is that uh, that's, those are the number of languages that we've succeeded in finding material online. For the vast majority of cases, it's and it's not finding anything new, right? So for a lot of these languages, there might be a single Bible translation that's online. You can follow links so as much as you want, but you're not going to find anything else. Um, so, so that website is crimadon.org. There's great data sets if you're interested in a particular language. There's a page for every language, all 2,500 languages, um, and you can click through and download word lists and lists of URLs written in the language and so on. Um, and then a second project was similar in spirit, which was to just collect everything written in the language in language X or language Y. So this is called the Indigenous Tweets Project. Um, the focus was to collect everything written on Twitter in indigenous or minority languages. So I started that in 2011. Um, it's now collecting tweets in 180 languages. Um, I mentioned I think 270 to 300 languages on Twitter, so I'm doing the 180 smallest essentially. Uh, I'm not worrying about the 100 or so very um, prominent languages on Twitter. Uh, so you can visit that website and it's got a page for every language and shows the top tweeters and statistics about them. So it was intended as a kind of menu for people to decide who to follow in their language or to discover that there really are other people out there. Um, there's something like 13,000 people tweeting in Irish on a regular basis. Um, more details, so I, I collect um, RSS feeds so from blogs and news sites. So I track all of those RSS feeds. Uh, that provides regular updated material um, from a lot of websites. Uh, and then I can feed those to the crawler and then follow the links in those and so on and so forth. Um, I collect data from Facebook as well. That's become harder. They've made that harder since the Cambridge Analytica stuff has happened. But you can still collect material pub uh, posted to public groups. Um, and then again, from when people, for example, when people post a tweet, they often post a tweet with a link in it. 
you can take those links and you can feed those to the crawler. Similarly with Facebook posts, if there's a link posted there, you can feed those to the crawler. So this all is sort of a feedback loop. Similarly, another feedback loop is as you crawl, you can discover new websites with language material. Those websites might have an RSS feed because it might be some news feed you've never seen before, some news site, and then you can take those and add those to the RSS feed list. So, uh, so it's sort of self-sustaining. If there's enough material in the language, it just runs and runs. And amazingly, for a language that is supposedly dying, there are at least 250 million words of Irish out on the web, which is uh, not too shabby for a dying language. Um, it's, um, it's grown a lot, so I sometimes like to say that I think there's, so we're, we're in a sense in a golden age of writing in Irish. So there's more Irish that's been written, um, I would say, since the year 2000 than was written in the thousand years before that. So um, it's in part because the web is a, is a written medium, but there's a really active community of people uh, using the language online. So that's good news for the, for the work that I'm doing. My brother sent me this uh, the other day. I wanted to, I wanted to, um, which I thought was kind of funny, but I wanted to raise this issue as a as a sort of serious issue at the same time. So that's all well and good. This this process of crawling the web and collecting training data and so on, uh, and it works very well for Irish. But it, the reality is that it doesn't work, and for the vast majority of the languages that are out there, um, and the reason for that is that because there are very complicated and sometimes probably unsolvable problems that prevent people from using their language online. Um, and those go down to just total lack of access to the internet, lack of phones and computers and devices, um, and then more fundamental things when people are hungry or um, don't feel safe in their home and these sort of deeper societal issues, it doesn't it means that they're not on Twitter and so on and so forth. So, uh, so it's important to sort of step back and say this all sounds great, but the reality for a lot of the communities and some of the community, like, communities I work with um, is that they are solving these sort of uh, these um, issues lower on Maslow's hierarchy before they can work on revitalizing their language and certainly before they can start worrying about social media and things like that. Um, so a bit of a digression, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what I call linguistic landscape. So in, in the context of sociolinguistics, I think this generally means if you're walking around Montreal or something like that, all the signs are in French, and um, if you feel like you're in a French-speaking place, uh, there's signage in Ireland, in the west of Ireland, which is supposed to all be in Irish. Um, there was a question at the panel. Uh, last night from uh, a young woman who'd studied Irish in the Gaeltacht area, one of the strongest Gaeltacht areas, and she was concerned that when you go into the shop, all of the packaging and all the materials and all of the magazines and newspapers are all in English, right? And that's true, and that's the way it is. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of a strong believer in the power of linguistic landscape to, I don't know, affect people's behavior. Um, and I think it's also true online. So, so one of the Pretty early on in this work, I decided that it was important to have a fully Irish language immersed environment on the computer or on mobile devices and so on. And what that's meant is that I spend way too much of my time translating software and websites. Um, so, um, and again, the, the goal here is to just normalize seeing the language on the computer. Ideally, what that means is people are used to the terminology and they're used to using an Irish language software that they'll be comfortable doing it and more, maybe be more comfortable um, conducting their lives on social media, for example, through the language as well. Um, so this is kind of a long history. I won't run through, through the whole story, but there was actually a fully localized <coughs> version of Mac OS in the 1990s. Um, produced by sort of a pioneer in Irish software translation in Marion Gunn. Um, that was, I don't know the version numbers, but it, it existed for several years. And at some point, Apple, I think when they switched over to OS X, whatever year that was, they just dropped support for Irish unilaterally. So all of that work that went into that software translation was then lost and gone. Um, so what we did shortly after that was we started looking at open source. So um, to sort of take the corporate interest out of the equation. If Apple could sort of pull the rug out from under that translation, 
if we do things with open source software, then we have control and we can do the building and so on. Uh, so we translated Firefox and 2003 and uh, OpenOffice and lots of other open source packages and um, things were great. Um, but the landscapes has shifted a little bit in terms of translating software. So we had Mozilla Thunderbird, which maybe you don't know, is a, it was an email handler, so you could just download sort of like Outlook if you run Outlook on, a, on your desktop. Um, but people don't do their email on their computer anymore. You use Gmail or whatever online service for email. And then similarly, um, I mean, people still use, I guess, Microsoft Office, but um, there's a lot of that has moved into the cloud. So uh, if you use Google Docs or whatever Microsoft's online services. Um, and what that means is you can't just translate some open source package. What it means is you now have to, we're back in the situation that we're in where you have to collaborate with these companies if you want to have the, these websites, Gmail or Google Docs or whatever it is in your language. And so we've kind of come full circle and then we're back having to go hat in hand to the companies and say, can we please translate Gmail? Um, so there's this notion of transplantation, uh, which is the fact that none of the companies that I've mentioned so far pay their translators to do, to do their work. So Facebook started this um, in 2008 or so. They launched the Spanish version of Facebook that was completely crowdsourced. Um, so I think they, they just put up all the strings you had to translate to translate Facebook, and then however many millions of people are speaking Spanish on Facebook did all the work in a very short time. Um, and that was a great success, so they've rolled that out to lots of other languages as well, but it's all crowdsourced, right? So, and a lot of us are satisfied to do this work if it means that we are partially solving, solving this problem. Uh, but the frustrating part is that um, they decide what's the some pool of languages that they will let do this work for free. And if you're not among that lucky group, then you have really no alternative, right? even though you're willing to do the work for free, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, right, so this is, uh, these. we've succeeded in collaborating in some cases. We had great collaboration with Google to do Gmail and Irish about five years ago, and that was launched in Dublin to, to great fanfare. Um, we were able to do that because we, I made a personal connection with an Irish person, an Irish speaker who worked at Google in Dublin. And this is how the story has gone for a lot of the translations of software into minority languages. They've happened because um, of a connection. There was a, say, a Hawaiian speaker working at Apple or somebody interested in Cherokee working at Google. Those are how, that's how these things have happened. Um, that's great, but it's not really a scalable strategy if we want to say, let's get the next 400 languages available in Gmail or whatever. Um, so one of the things I've co-founded with a group, there are nine of us who are actively engaged in software translation into Irish. So we have uh, an academy of localizers uh, in Ireland, um, and the nine of us do the great majority of the software translation. And we've had pretty good success. So this is a, my laptop where I try to open up all my different applications. So I have LibreOffice, which is the new version of OpenOffice. Uh, here's Gmail in Irish. Uh, Facebook in Irish and some other stuff. So Firefox is also in Irish. Um, so I can conduct most of my daily life uh, entirely through the language, especially so if you're um, like me, you just follow people on Twitter who tweet only in Irish and so on and so forth. So some victories in terms of linguistic landscape. Okay, so that was a digression. I want to just touch on one more aspect of data collection. Um, and so on. Um, and this is a new um, project launched just this summer, I'm pretty sure, um, that came out of Mozilla. I was a Mozilla collaborator um, for a long time, um, starting with the translation of Firefox. Uh, but Mozilla's done um, something great with the, what they're calling common voice. So they've recognized um, that voice interactions are gonna be sort of the wave of the future in terms of interacting with your devices and computers. Um, and to make that technology available, you need the training data. Training data in the context of speech recognition just means recordings of text together with their transcriptions. So this is a website you can go just visit, um, uh, I forget the address now, just Google Common Voice, I guess. <laughs> and um, it's a, they've launched it in I think, several dozen languages. So if you speak one of these languages, you can just go visit it. They have sample sentences 
you can either um, uh, click record and speak the sample sentence and it records you, or you can listen to other people's recordings and just validate them. So you say, oh yes, this person spoke that, <coughs> that sentence correctly. Um, and the hope is to collect um, millions and millions of samples and they're going to make everything available under a Creative Commons Zero license, so essentially just giving it all away for free. Um, and that's a huge, going to be a huge driver of, of research in this area um, because a lot of the big companies, they don't share the data they produce. Um, okay, so how am I on time? I, I want to I wanna talk about one sort of technical detail. I don't have a... Okay, it's... Um, I'm, I'm about okay. 20 minutes. Okay. Um, I wanted to, I don't know, are there computer scientists here? I want to do a, so a little bit of actual um, uh, language modeling or technology here and talk a little bit about some of the, some of the mathematics, but I won't go into it in any great detail. Um, so this is meant as an illustrative example of how you might uh, look at um, doing machine learning to help understand languages. So this is my favorite problem in, um, in all of computer science. So this is the idea of uh, creating a language model. So all a language model is, is if I give you a sentence, you have to give back to me the probability of that sentence. So what this means is that sentences that are, say, ungrammatical should be assigned very low probabilities. Sentences that have very common words would probably be high, assigned higher probabilities than rarer words, etc. Right? That's all it is. You give somebody a sentence and they have to give you the probability of that sentence back. So there's a famous quote by Chomsky which is obligatory to show <laughs> whenever you talk about language modeling and that's uh, the following, it's an entirely useless notion under any known interpretation of this term. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Chomsky, so to be fair, this, he was not really t talking about um, um, machine learning and language technologies. He's making a very particular point about linguistics and how you understand um, uh, languages as a linguistic scientist. But uh, in any case, it's funny because it is a wildly useful uh, concept and it's essentially the driver of all of the technologies that I described on the first slide. So, um, so what do I mean by this exactly? So if that's a sentence S, this is an entirely useless notion. Uh, so this is where we are only equation, I think. So that probability of this sentence, you can decompose as saying, what's the probability of seeing the word this at the beginning of a sentence, right? You could imagine how you might actually estimate that. You could collect a million sentences and see how many of them start with this, and that's some sort of estimate of that probability. Multiplied by the probability of seeing the word is after you've seen the word this, maybe at the beginning of a sentence. Um, so these are conditional probabilities. If you're not a mathematician, that's what that pipe means. Um, so this means what's the probability of this, assuming that you've already seen this, right? And then multiply by the probability of seeing the word entirely, assuming that you've just seen those two words, and then just multiply the whole thing out, all right? Um, fine, so that's a, that's a probability that you might hope to compute. Um, and in fact, I, I, I defined a language model as the probability of a sentence, um, but in fact, the way people usually deal with it in practice, what you're actually computing is what's the probability of the next word given the previous n words, right? So that's what people usually talk about when they say language modeling. Uh, fine. So um, this is my favorite point about this. This is why I love this problem so much. It's not only the driver of all these technologies, but it is, to, in some sense, like the fundamental question in AI to me. Um, so humans are really good at this. We, we can say things like um, the probability of seeing the word Friday following my party is this coming is probably, at least in our culture, probably greater than the probability of seeing the word Tuesday after my party <laughs> is this coming, right? And if you think about that for a second, it's mind-blowing. Um, mm -hmm. How would you get the, that there's this sort of real-world knowledge that you would have to bring to bear to get that estimate correct that is really hard for computers, right? Um, I could make that example even harder. A computer might actually be able to get this just by looking at big enough training data. Um, but anyway, you see that there's real world knowledge involved. Um, and then there's also things like grammar and long distance dependencies. Uh, the probability of seeing the word is after the man with the glasses is surely um, greater than the probability of seeing the word are. But if you don't look far enough back in the sentence, right, uh, the probability of seeing um, is after just glasses might actually be smaller, right? right? The glasses are... So in any case, uh, real-world knowledge comes into bear. 
Um, and you can actually make the argument that this, if you could um, do this as well as a human being, you have to bring, in to, to, bring to bear all of um, the things that humans are able to do. And in fact, you could argue that if you could do this perfectly, that you could um, defeat the Turing test in some sense. You could produce language as well as a human, well enough to, to um, confuse a human being. Uh, so I mentioned this, all the technologies I mentioned above are driven by this. Um, and so as a simple example, you can use one of these language models to actually generate text. So this is a little game that you can play if you produce a language model that produces probabilities. You can look at the probability distribution of the next word given the words that you've already seen. You could randomly choose that next word, but according to that probability distribution. And just by doing that, you can generate as much text as you want. Um, if you, you've probably gotten spam email that's generated this way, this is a common way that people try and generate uh, spam. Um, and it's one of the exercises I do with my Taming Big Data students as we train um, generative language models using Shakespeare and different, uh, well, we do Donald Trump speeches too, which is a, uh, a whole different story, but you can generate text in the style of X or Y. Um, Right, so then the point is that if you look at machine translation or speech recognition and you just step back for a second, machine translation is really about producing a text, right? You're producing a translation. Um, so it's a question of generating text. Uh, but it's a little bit harder because it's not just generating text based on a probability distribution, it's generating text conditioned on whatever the input sentence was. You can't generate anything you want. Um, but amazingly, the, the, the sort of latest versions of neural networks for machine translation really kind of take this, take this perspective. You take the input sentence, you encode it in some way, you pass that information on to essentially a language model that then figures out how to translate it just by generating the translation using something like a language model. Um, well, I'll skip over some more equations. Uh, but this is the point I just made. So this, these ideas are kind of baked into the, the latest versions of neural machine translation models. And then the important point is that if you, this has been well established in lots of research papers, that if you do better machine uh, language modeling, that you get better machine translation systems and speech recognition systems. There's lots of papers that say this. Um, so there's been kind of a revolution in this field. The field has sort of stalled out, um, say, 10 years ago, nobody had really done a huge advance in improving language models um, until people started applying neural networks to the problem. And there have been huge leaps forward even over the last year. Um, so the point that I want to make here is not to get into the details of how these neural language models work, but all of the papers virtually uh, in this flood of papers use English as their, as their test case. All right? And I know there are some linguists here English is a bad example of a language uh, in terms of representing linguistic diversity, for sure. Um, and in fact, my favorite of these papers um, was a paper that came out of Google's, the Google Brain Group um, two years ago. Uh, it was posted online about two years ago, the, um, um, Exploring the Limits of Language Modeling, I think is the title. Um, if you search in the PDF of that paper, the word English doesn't appear anywhere in the paper. So the idea is that it's implicit that we're studying, we are exploring the limits of language modeling. Um, what does that mean? That means looking at English, right? And it's not really true. Um, and what's interesting is that if you actually do some experiments with some of these um, models and you apply them to a language like Irish, they're, they're sometimes better, they're not always better. Um, it's also been pretty well established in, in uh, the literature that neural language models and neural machine translation models uh, work really well when you have lots and lots of training data, but they will actually trail behind some more traditional models in the absence of large training sets. And obviously, in, in my context, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, so maybe this will be my last, my last point. I want to say at least one thing about how you might use some linguistic knowledge to improve the state of the art. And this, I don't think these ideas are entirely new. There are people that are working on this for lots of other languages that, are, that have some morphology and so on. And there's a lot of work on doing neural models at the um, subword level. So you can work um, by doing language models with syllables or with um, morphemes, if you can decompose into morphemes, or even single characters. Um, the, the point is that something like that has to come into play.
So here's just a fun example for anybody who's interested in the Celtic languages or Irish um, of something that you could incorporate to help improve the situation. So Celtic languages have what are called initial mutations. So what's interesting about these, when you think about language generatively and as in terms of language models, is that almost always you can tell the mutation that's going to be on the word just by looking at the previous two words. It's not 100% of the time, and there are also some dialect differences in the way people do this. But other than that, this is, it's virtually, uh, they don't carry any information content in the sense of entropy or something like that. So as an example, the word for sailboat or the phrase for sailboat is bad shoal. Um, if I want to say my sailboat, then it's, that's the word for my, then you have to change um, the word for um, boat, bond, by inserting the letter H, changes the pronunciation. And then if you say our sailboat, uh, it's our mod shoal. Um, so these are just markers uh, that are really there kind of for phonetic reasons. Um, but if I see this word in this context, then um, and make strips the mutation M off the word, I know linguistically that it has to be there, just by knowing that the word R is before that, our. Um, right, so what's the issue here if you're doing language modeling? I guess I didn't really define what an n-gram model is, but the point is that um, if you are producing a language model just by counting things, right? I want to say, how, what's the probability of seeing this at the beginning of a sentence? I said, well, just look at all your sentences and count the proportion that have the word this. This is essentially how the, the, um, the state of the art worked in, say, 10 years ago, was just by counting instances of words and phrases. If you're just counting words, the issue is that these three things are all different words, right? Word taken very naively. Um, and that would mean that you're not learning any generalizations about uh, this word bald or the fact perhaps that this word is a common um, co-locate um, with boat, which it is. You're not getting all the information that you could if you're just exposed to these three examples, say, right? So you can learn better generalizations if you're aware of these sort of linguistic differences. This is, a, again, a well-known well -known phenomenon when there's morphology and, say, verb endings and so on and so forth. It's exactly the same issue. Um, well, there, it's not exactly the same because there the difference is that uh, verb endings often carry semantic information. You can't just strip them away and not lose any information. Here, you virtually can. Um, right. So um, going back to that um, original Google translation, this is an example where, where Google gets it wrong, presumably because they're not taking any of this into account. Um, so uh, right, so that example did not have the mutation M on where it said through the, through the road. Uh, it needs a mutation there, and it was just a generalization that they weren't able to make um, based on the training that they had. Uh, so the idea here is, well, you fix it. So something, an idea, and again, this idea goes, goes back even to kind of pre-neural network language models, and that is that you can factor this into two problems, right? One is the problem of predicting mutations, which, as I've just described, is a really easy problem. You can get it virtually 100% correct. Um, and then the other problem is just do language modeling where you ignore all the mutations, right? And by ignoring them, you hope that you can learn better generalizations and you can get away with less data, right? Or for the same amount of data, you can learn more things. Uh, and there are lots of examples like this. So um, I was gonna show a couple, couple of my projects. Uh, maybe I'll just sort of leave this up here. Um, one of them is a machine translation engine that I developed for the Gaelic languages, so Scottish, Irish, and Manx Gaelic. that uses a lot of the ideas I just talked about. Um, and then the other project is it's also effectively a machine translation project. It's an Irish language standard or standardizer. So it takes texts that were written. It was a big spelling and grammar reform in the 1950s or late 40s um, that radically changed the way the language is written. Um, and again, a lot of the best written material was produced before uh, that time. Uh, and if you want to search it or you want to incorporate it into uh, dictionaries or want to use it for training machine language, uh, language models or machine translation, um, you have to normalize it so that it's all using the same spelling. Um, so effectively, it's a machine translation project that translates from pre-standard Irish into standard Irish, so these two very closely related languages. Um, so that's it. Mm -hmm.